This month's SPE Web Extra is brought to you by Wheatstone, maker of the intelligent IP audio network used by studios around the globe. The AES67 compatible Wheatnet IP intelligent network is the most comprehensive end-to-end -end studio network system in the world with a full line of consoles, software apps, IP audio appliances, and third-party add-ons for any studio workflow, size, or purpose. Wheatstone. Well, good afternoon. I'm Chris Scher, Member Communications Director of the Society of Broadcast Engineers and the co-host of this month's episode of the SBE Web Extra, the SBE Chapter of the Web. This is a monthly SBE meeting that's usually held on the third Monday of the month. The SBE is the Association for Broadcast and Multimedia Technology Professionals with about 5,000 members, mostly in the U.S., but also around the world. The host of today's SBE Web Extra is SBE board member Kirk Harnack, who is also the chair of the SBE Social Networking Committee. Hi, Kirk. Hey, Chris. Thanks so much. I appreciate that great intro, and thank you for helping put together another one of these meetings on the web, the SBE Web Extra. I'm Kirk Harnack uh, in my Nashville studio, and I tell you, our guest today is uh, he's absolutely fascinating. As a part of broadcast engineering that we normally don't come across very often, I'll go ahead and tell you who it is. It's John Landry. And John has a skill that is just just amazing. Can we we, we want to bring John on for just a second to, to say hi, and then we'll get to the announcements. Hey, John. Hello, folks. How are you? I'm I'm good, and it's good to see you. And we're gonna uh, tease you and get right back to you in a few minutes. John is going to be talking to us about recovering audio from old old media, a specific kind of media. Or actually, it's more than one kind, and you need to be able to tell the difference. Yeah, that's kind of a tease. And I got to talk to John about this a couple days ago, and it's absolutely fascinating. So well, I'm getting ready. I'm excited about a terrific SBE Web Extra. Chris, you've got some announcements, though. Go ahead. Sure do. We have your SBE member update for February 17, 2020. We start with several webinars by SBE on the calendar. February 25 brings us module one of the audio over IP series. This one starts with a review of IP networking fundamentals found in and required by an IP network infrastructure supporting real-time media content. The RF201 series continues on March 12 with TV combiners. And on March 24, the audio over IP series continues with module two, AOIP basics. For more info on webinars by SPE, go to spe.org slash webinars. Looking further into 2020, the SBE will again present the Leadership Development Course August 4 to 6 in Atlanta. You can learn more and register to attend at sbe.org slash LBC. The SBE has presented the course since 1997. Rodney Vandeveer, a professor, a professor of organizational leadership and supervision at Purdue University, brings more than 30 years of industrial and business experience in management positions in human resources, training and development, and manufacturing. On the certification side, if you'd like to take an SBE certification exam, here are some dates to know. SBE certification exams will be held on April 21 at the NAB show in Las Vegas. The application deadline for that is March 9th. Local exams will be held at chapters the week of June 5th. The application deadline for those is April 17. And if a local chapter exam is not convenient for you, private proctoring is available. Contact the SBE National Office for more details. And for all the information on SBE certification, go to sbe.org slash certification. The SBE mail dues renewal notices last month. You should have gotten yours by now, but if not, you can renew online at the SBE website or contact the national office. SBE membership for the year begins on April 1, but don't wait until the last minute to renew or you might risk losing your member benefits. And if you are going to the Las, if you're going to Las Vegas in April for the NAB show, add the SBE events to your calendar while you're there. There's a link on the SBE homepage with all the events. You can also check out the SBE at PBS TechCon information if you'll be there a little bit earlier. And that's your SBE member update for February 17, 2020. Thanks a lot, Chris. Appreciate it very much. Always good to have announcements uh, to hear them and to be done with them. So thank you very much. <laughs> do check out those. Do check out the webinars. Always helpful, and I try to attend uh, well all of them that I can, which is probably about half of them. But uh, hey, if you're an SBE member plus member, uh, you it, you don't have to worry about pulling out the credit card or the, or the checkbook. Well, welcome into another SBE Web Extra. This is the one for the month of February 2020, and our guest is going to talk to us about something that I think is absolutely fascinating. I've actually had a couple of 
opportunities to to put some of these ideas to work, although I, I didn't know I was putting John's ideas to work. Let's bring John Landry in. And John, give us the uh, the elevator speech about John Landry. Who are you and, and, and why are you going to be talking <laughs> to us about, about this topic? Well, as you can guess, I work in radio here at Rewind 106.5 WCFR in beautiful Springfield, Vermont. But I've been in radio for quite some time. I worked at ABC in uh, New York. I worked at CBS and uh, Westwood One. And before that, at several stations all over, uh, well, mostly the East. But uh, in the last about 17 years, I've been doing a radio show um, on the side as an assumed character, basically uh, playing old records from mostly the 1920s, sometimes the teens, a little bit later. I've been collecting stuff like this ever since I was a kid. Somebody uh, gave me a record player when I was four years old. And uh, about a year or so later, one of my mother's friends who had daughters that were probably teenager by then, uh, wanted to get rid of all their kitty records. Uh, they were bright plastic colored records um, that all, most of them went at 78. And so um, I wound up getting into 78s from there and uh, discovering that I liked this odd kind of music that's sort of, uh, well, it's obsolete. It's fallen past and, uh, you know, past its prime in many ways, but I'm a collector of it. I've been doing it for a long time, uh, listening to it, listening uh, good and bad critically and restoring some of the stuff too. So what I'd like to talk about is what you might run into as a broadcast engineer and uh, the kinds of things that you would have to uh, do to start playing or at least extract some of the sound in a, in a quality manner. Um, these records are often, uh, well, they're different types of them. There's, uh, yeah, that's what I was going to ask uh, because yeah. we, you educated me last week to some of these, these differences and I had no idea. I, I noticed that different records, uh, old versus new, feel different. But, um, you know, this is, some are do. a bit more flexible, some are really stiff. And I thought that was just the difference between a 78 and a, and a 33 and a third LP or maybe a, a 45. But uh, w w let's imagine that um, what happens at some stations like WBGO in Newark, New Jersey, a listener, mm -hmm. uh, a benefactor um, in the will, <laughs> in their will and last will and testament, mm -hmm. put, I give my record collection of fabulous jazz music to WBGO. And now mm -hmm. WBGO has this great collection. They'd love to play it on the air, but ah, you better take some precautions before doing this. And I've been to another radio station in the New York City area where they had a whole room just for transferring uh, old tape and discs uh, into digital media for, for long-term storage. So what are, what are some of the first things that a, an engineer might, might be confronted with in in a, whether it's a gift or a, a purchase or whatever, uh, or somebody just drops some records by, what do you have to do to, to get started in making sure that you do this? You can't just necessarily drop your favorite uh, turntable, tone arm, and stylus on it. That's correct. You need to know exactly what it is that you're dealing with. Uh, most of us are quite familiar with um, vinyl records, at least LPs and 45s. In fact, if we can bring up visual number one, on the screen here, we'll have a look at some long play records, which are typical. I mean, some of these records I pulled out, I'm sure you recognize, you might even have some of them still. These are vinyl microgroove LPs, um, and they were popular. They were invented in 1948, and they were pretty much the default music format uh, for most of the, our lifetime, the, uh, the 60s and 70s. If we look at visual two, we've got some 45s, and of course, those are um, about the same vintage. Those were usually singles, and the other ones usually had multiple cuts on them. And um, one of the things you have to be aware of is long play records and uh, 45s originally came out as just mono-sourced records. The groove spacing on a mono 45 is a little bit bigger than it is for a stereo one. Uh, specifically, oh. the stylus that originally was supposed to be playing those is about one mil or one thousandth of an inch. When stereo came along, they had to uh, change the shape and the stylus a little bit. And so it went down to uh, about 0.7, seven tenths of a mil. Uh, we contrast that with a 78 RPM record, which is visual number three. 78s were pretty much the standard of, uh, of disc record recording from about 1899 up until 1957. In 1957, the Record Industry of America, the RIAA, decertified 78 RPM as a speed. So after that point, any members weren't supposed to be making them anymore. And uh, that was the end of 78 RPM. But the grooves on a 78 are about uh, seven times larger 
than a, uh, a typical stereo LP, which means if you play it with a stereo LP stylus, the stylus is riding way down in the bottom of the groove where there is no or hardly any information, but lots and lots and lots of dirt and noise. So mm. you need to be aware of what the records are, uh, what's not just the speed, but what, uh, what format are the grooves and whatnot. Um, something to be um, a little bit more aware of is that um, there were two ways of cutting sound into the grooves. 90% of the records that you're going to run into are what are called lateral cut records. And lateral cut, um, the groove is actually modulating side to side as it's going around the record in a, in a spiral. Whereas vertical cut, which was used for some higher end applications and a couple of uh, specific record companies, Thomas Edison in particular, where the modulation is up and down inside the groove, the groove is the same width all the way across the record, so you can get more of them. Plus, because it's going up and down, you're not really limited. Um, with the lateral ones, you can't, ex you can't go too far without going into the next groove. Whereas vertical cut records, you got lots and lots of room. So they, by nature, in the early days, they have more dynamic range or the potential for more dynamic range. Um, a lot of radio stations um, in the 30s and 40s uh, did use vertical cutting for um, playback. Sometimes they did it for archiving. The quality that you could get in the 1930s on a vertical cut record was pretty astonishing relative to what you got on the uh, lateral cuts. But Vertical cut records are uh, are minimal. They're not common. You don't see them too often. So, um, but you know, it's it's it, it's nice to know that that's a potential and be aware of what you need to do to transfer them. And one um, of the things that that you mentioned people come across now and then is the the Edison uh, uh, diamond disc. What what is that and what kind <laughs> of cutting does it have? Yes. Well, it, uh, it, just about everything made by Thomas Edison um, is vertical cut. And the Edison Diamond Disc is a, it looks like a 78, but it's about a quarter of an inch thick. And uh, usually it has Edison's picture right on the label. Some of them had paper labels, some of them have etched labels. But yes, Thomas Edison's picture is on the front. And um, it was a superior method of recording. In fact, the Edison company continued to use the non-electrical, the acoustical method of recording all the way up long after anybody else did uh, until about 1928. And they went electric around that time, a good three years after everybody else had adopted electrical recording. And the difference in the sound quality is, is, is night and day. It's, it's, it's so, almost as vivid as, you know, fr from LPs to CDs. Based on, on what you've said here, it seems like the, the most common uh, anomaly that a a radio station is going to come across is if somebody brings in some 78 rpm records uh, and says can can you play these can you transcribe them can you put them on a mm -hmm. on a flash drive for me right and so the problem That's is going to be that that they've got uh, a turntable and they've got a, a, a cartridge and they've got a stylus that's way too small for the 78 what What's the easiest way that a, a radio station could acquire the right kind of uh, stylus and, and or cartridge to play this back? Oh, and you're going to get into it later uh, about the preamplifier because it may be a different preamplifier that's needed as well. Yes, there's a lot to consider. Um, most people, such such as I did when I worked at a radio station, would probably answer the phone and it would be somebody that's like, you know, my grandfather died and we used to listen to these records together. And could you, is there any way you could transfer them? You know, can you can you make them, you know, make, me look, make them listenable for me? And so that's more than likely uh, 78 RPM records are probably going to come into a, a broadcaster's engineer, a broadcasting engineer's uh, uh, world from somebody from the outside. Not very many radio stations that I'm aware of have any 78s in their, you know, in their possession. Some probably do, but uh, if they do, they may not have the equipment to play them back. Most of us who've been working in radio for a while pretty much know that there is not much turntables or not many turntables at studios much anymore. The other, chan the other possibility is, do they work properly? Um, you and I and many of us have had experience with reel-to-reel -reel tape and turntables and we understand those machines when they sit on the shelf for a long time they may not work perfectly or work as they're supposed to when you take them off the shelf and plug them in they may need lubrication parts need to be cleaned parts may need to be replaced 
because some things have a definite sh shelf life. Um, the typical turntable a lot of people try to use for 78s is the good old Rusco, uh, what we used to call the Rumble Master. And <laughs> it's a it's a decent turntable for 78s with a couple of exceptions. They're very, very noisy. Um, the Ruscos and the Gates uh, were designed to speed the record up to, up to playing speed very quickly. And they do so at the expense of having a lot of noise in the vertical plane. Um, so I, I do have one, but I never use it to play 78s with. In fact, it's just sort of there as a, cur as a, uh, as a curiosity more than anything else. Um, a lot of times those machines, uh, if you leave them in gear, the, the driving puck has a flat spot on it, and that yeah. considerably adds to the noise that you're going to get. Um, and in addition, uh, they need lubrication, and sometimes tone arms need lubrication too. So that's uh, there's a lot to be considered about it. Having having a, a turntable, a platter that's ready to go and, and, and you know is going to work properly, is sometimes an, an obstacle to getting this done because usually you wind up getting the records first and it's like, oh my gosh. And, you know, the other thing a lot of people need to realize is uh, the records should be clean. If you want to get the best sound off the record, the record should be properly cleaned. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on the subject of cleaning in a little bit. Um, one of the things a lot of people, uh, at least those of us who've worked in radio for a while and used to have vinyl records of our own, uh, we're all familiar with the disc washer D4, the little um, brown thing with a felt on it. And yeah. that is not a record cleaner. That is a device for removing dust from the record before you play it. But it's not really going to go down deep in the grooves and remove nicotine or uh, dust from uh, dust, dust that came off as the stylus went through. Uh, and a good cleaning, a good proper cleaning can actually reduce the noise level. On some 78s, I've had it, uh, I've actually just dropped the needle and done an unscientific measurement of just the raw noise. And after cleaning, I've been able to get 15 dB less noise. So, wow. Um, wow. yeah. So, Cleaning makes all the difference. Before you even try to play the record, it's got to be properly cleaned. If, yeah. if any engineer can get a, a 15 dB better signal to noise ratio <laughs> just by cleaning. Now, I, I'm, yeah. I'm curious, do I, you know, I've taken audio consoles apart, electronics out, just taken the tub and gone to the car mm -hmm. wash with that. I'm guessing the car wash is not the place to clean a 78. Well, not really. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of discussion on various groups about it, but the art, the, the, the way that most archivists, um, people who do this for a living, uh, clean the records is with a device. Well, it's with a vacuum. There are expensive ones that some radio stations used to have a, cape, a company called Keith Monks made it. It looked like a huge mm -hmm. turntable, but instead of having an arm, it had a little, uh, a little pickup that was, uh, had, was attached to a vacuum. Um, a more modern and somewhat cheaper and easier to get device is a device called the Nitty Gritty. Um, and there's a few imitations of the Nitty Gritty because it's a little bit mm -hmm. pricey. And then I have my own method that I've devised, which works pretty well. I, I just took an old uh, cast off BSR changer that I got someplace. And I use that as the uh, table to put the record on. And I, I just use a paintbrush and I brush uh, nitty gritty record, clu record cleaning fluid on it. And then I have a modified vacuum cleaner where I suck the moisture off. One of the things about 78 RPM records is the material that it's made from. Most of them are, are made from shellac. Shellac dissolves in alcohol, so you never use alcohol on them. Ooh, um, yeah. And yeah, yeah. And um, the other thing about the shellac is it is what's called a hydrophilic plastic which means over time it can absorb moisture and that does degrade the surface dramatically. I can usually tell when people bring me 78s that have been stored in a basement or um, you know, in a garage because the surface is kind of dull and flat and sometimes if it's been many, many years that it's gotten wet and then dried and then wet and then dried, um, I can tell by the sound um, so it does affect it. You want to minimize the amount of moisture that you expose a 78 to. Um, there's a picture. In fact, one of the LP records I used for that uh, photograph is an LP that many of us had from a, uh, a very famous uh, novelty DJ named Dr. Demento. There's a picture <laughs> on the back. There's a picture on the back of that jacket of that LP of him actually washing a record as if he's washing it in the sink. And I used to do that. Basically, I did it because I saw him do it. Um, it, you can wash records as if you wash a dish. The thing is, you've got to make sure it's absolutely positively dry as soon as you can, and you don't want to wash the labels off. 
Now, um, in the case of something like, say, an instantaneous record, and if we could look at, uh, if we could look at uh, visual number four on our visuals here, this is an instantaneous record. Um, this is the kind of record that you will find um, a lot of times at radio stations. And it is a flat aluminum disc that's coated with cellulose nitrate and was cut with a record cutter. This disc, um, the surface, of course, is just bonded to that aluminum, so it can come off fairly easy. But a lot of times people just wrote with a pen or a pencil on the label. And as you see on this one, there's a there's a label. I, I guess I think it's I think it says crap. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and that's probably what that record is. But um, you don't want to wash off any of the indications as to what the record is when you're cleaning it. So uh, that's very important. Um, instantaneous records come into several categories. That particular one there is a homemade recording, probably made by one of my uncles or my grandfather because they had a machine to do that with, or they're made at radio stations. And we have um, at various stations that I've worked at, I've run into them and taken them home and uh, reused them. In fact, if we look at uh, number six, uh, or actually number five, visual number five, we'll actually get to see an actual radio station uh, transcription. This one is from WBZ, and it's a bunch of cuts that are promoting the Eastern States Exposition of 1960. And I put a dollar bill down there to show the size uh, reference. That's a 16-inch diameter record. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, those are those are announcements that were cut and aired, you know, just like commercials. They would have three or four turntables and... Uh, and uh, and when the when the cuts were dead, a lot of times the engineers would put tape across the uh, across the uh, tracks so that they couldn't be played anymore, or they just rub oh. a pencil on them. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, instantaneous recordings require a little bit more care because uh, the material, like I said, the material they're made from is a cellulose nitrate, and uh, it it can degrade if it's not um, not stored properly, and uh, it's also very flammable. So, so you oh, keep oh. them away from anything. Yes. So this is mm -hmm. this is actually yes. you can't use uh, you, you should can't use alcohol uh, on no. shellac, and you can't and you should, if you do use water, you got to get it right off because it, it, it'll yes. it'll soak in like a sponge. Uh, you, you know, mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest problems I've seen with seventy eights, at least I I believe I may have some here in the basement uh, as part of a, a gift that somebody gave me. I think the biggest problem with them is mildew on them because they've been in the basement. Uh, well, we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll wash and take that off. Well, it's interesting. I've only run into, in all the years that I've been collecting, I've only run into a couple of records that had uh, 78s that had mildew on them. Mm. Um, shellac is not an ideal surface for, for mildew to grow on. Uh, ironically, <laughs> ironically, well, no, I, I've, I've, I have a couple of records where there's mildew on the label, but the record yeah, itself yeah. is fine. Uh, um, maybe that's what I'm thinking of, yeah. And, and the other possibility is it could the mildew could grow on the dirt on the record if the dirt if the record has a lot of oh. a really really serious case of dust the mildew will grow on that, but uh, mildew becomes a factor more often with uh, with cylinders, specifically uh, the very first uh, cylinders that were made by Edison and then by Columbia Records uh, were what are called two minute cylinders, and they were made on brown wax and the brown wax mm. does in fact attract mildew like you wouldn't believe mold mm. in fact the mold will actually grow onto it and eat it. So uh, mold is more of a factor with that. It, I have seen mold grow on instantaneous records. Um, so that's, a, and that's another, another thing to consider when storing these, that they, they really shouldn't be stored in moist areas at all. If, if a person recorded some discs at home, now I, I understand that uh, my, my maternal grandfather didn't go uh, to the war effort. Uh, he stayed home. Uh, during World War II, but he recorded things that were going on around uh, where they lived at, at the time in Indiana and sent that off to uh, some of his, his brothers and other relatives uh, that were overseas with the war effort. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, yeah. what, might, what might he have recorded those on? What was the, the, the lathe and would, would that have been a vertical modulation or a lateral? Well, most of the home recording machines were lateral for the simple mm. reason that you wanted to send them to people and have people, oh, look, it's from Aunt Susie. Ooh, let's listen to it. Um, so it was meant to be compatible. Um, the, it's interesting. The machine that my grandparents had, uh, my grandfather had, was originally set up to cut from the center of the record backward, like a radio oh. station would want it. But all you had to do was read the instructions, and there was just one, one mechanical part you flipped over, and then it would cut the regular way. And so some of the records I have are center start and some of them are outside start. But um, 
a lot of those machines, um, the, the most the most common ones, would cut on uh, onto an instantaneous disc, which is uh, you know, cellulose nitrate. And um, most of them, had, actually, a lot of them came with a dual speed turntable. So you could record at 33 if you wanted to have something a little bit longer. Um, the sound quality at 33 is not terribly good. So most people did 78 and and most you know most wind up phonographs you can get them to go 33 but it's a real challenge so 78 is pretty much the default speed until uh, until they invented uh, good turntables in the 1940s and 50s that went 33 reliably uh, there is there was an, in fact a commercial um, a commercial recording made by RCA Victor and started uh, started around 1931 and they sold them for about two years. They called them program transcriptions, and they were 33 and a third shellac records. They look like 78s, yeah. but they have a, a gold-colored label that says program transcription on it. And um, you needed a machine that turned at 33 and a third. And the only machines RCA Victor made at the time was the top-of-the-line console that sold in 1931 for about six or seven hundred dollars. So. It was a, a doomed experiment, although some of the classical uh, recordings that they did make uh, stayed in the catalog and were available up until about World War II. But the quality, when you slow, uh, with the older technology, when you slow it down to 33 and a third RPM, it does not sound good. Um, and that was one of the many uh, things that was a lot of time and money was spent on in the 1930s and then the early 1940s to improve uh the, the recording, the recording, uh, the recording quality, but not only that, but the, the time, because uh, in the late 30s, a couple of people at Columbia Records realized that if they could record an entire movement of a symphony on one record so that people wouldn't have to get up and flip the record over or change it, then we'd be doing the musical world a favor. And that was the genesis of coming up with a better system. But uh, that was the 1930s when they started and then World War II got involved in the way and so we had a long go a long wait before we had the long playing record that we now know come out in 1948 we're gonna uh we're talking to john landry uh about uh about getting old getting re audio off of old recordings and doing it well doing it right uh to get the best quality and i i found out to, i was today years old when i found out if you take a mm -hmm. 78 and play it uh, with a, a modern stylus, uh, you're going to get a lot of noise. And I always thought it was because the, the modulation on a 78 was very, very low. But no, I, I wasn't playing it back right. So we're going to get advice from John here in just a couple minutes, uh, again, about the stylus to use and about cartridges, if they're different for lateral or for vertical cut. Not many vertical cuts out there, but interesting to know that. And then we're going to also need to talk about uh, differences in equalization. And, and why your RIAA preamp uh, may not sound very good on an older record. So we're going to be getting into that in just a few minutes. I'm Kirk Harnack. You're watching or listening to the SBE Web Extra for February, uh, the year 2020. Again, John Landry is our host, and I'm going to toss it back to Chris Shearer at the SBE. Chris? Thanks, Kirk. And John Landry is our guest. You're the host, but that's, you know. Minor details. Anyway, Sorry. the SBE Web Extra is made possible by the generous support of Weestone, our sponsor, and the SBE Web Extra will be right back. Hi, I'm Jay with Weedstone. What I want to demo for you today um, is a Cisco switch failure. And the best way I can do that is to reach around the back here and unplug a cable. Okay, you'll see now I have some of the stuff is still working. We've lost an air studio over here. Um, we've lost some production rooms. So while you're taking a look at that, I'm frantically going to come over here and start replacing some Cat5 cables. Um, if you look right here, I know this was the transmission path for half of the system. So by simply plugging these in, you're going to see some audio return. We've got audio restored on every single surface here in the system. By configuring your Cisco switches so you can load share and put half the the network on one switch and half the network on the other switch, this will allow you at least to get around a switch failure. Thanks for watching. Well, once again, we want to thank Wheatstone for sponsoring the SBE Web Extra. Did you know that by watching this webcast, you earned one half of an SBE recertification point when you recertify? Let's get back to talking about records with Kirk and John Landry. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chris. We are talking to John Landry, and uh, he's at the WCFR studio. Uh, is that in, in, in what, 
Springfield, Where's Vermont. That? I said, look, Springfield, Springfield Vermont. Vermont. Yep. And look what just came. My, my SBE well, well, renewal right here. So I'm all set and ready to go. Right on time. Yeah, so, yeah there you go. <laughs> what so, time is that? That's make awesome. sure you renew your membership. Yes. So John is well, educating us about uh, about playing audio as, as good as it can be. And John, you've mentioned that you may have but one chance to play good audio off a really old transcription. So maybe you can, uh, again, tell us... Um, if, if, if I've got, you know, a lot, of, a lot of stations still have these these Technics turntables that would do, uh, what, 33, 45, and 78, if I'm not mistaken. I thought they, they would do 78. Maybe I'm wrong. But I certainly have the, the Rusco Rumble Master. Uh, sorry. The Q, the, whatever. The Rusco turntables <laughs> that would do, do 78. <laughs> no disrespect to yeah. Rusco. We all had them. Well, and, uh, and, and work out the flat spot. But yeah, what do I need if for for a stylus to to play this back properly, or at least do the best I can? Well, this the you need a cartridge that uh, has different styli available for it, and uh. um, you know it's the in the last couple of years, two of the major manufacturers who've been around forever, both Sure and Stanton, got out of the business right as records were starting to become popular again and demand for their product was increasing. So right now, um, you basically there's Grado, which is located in New York City, that makes uh, the make 78 Styli for their cartridges and Audio-Technica has 78 Styli available for theirs. Um, there are, uh, the generic 78 stylus that you get is 2.7 mils. That's to say 2.7 uh, thousandths of an inch. And it's usually conical. And that will work. That will generally give you a very decent sound from the record. However, it supposes that the record is not worn. One of the things that run, you run into with 78s in particular is um, most of them were played with a, a, basically a steel pin, a steel needle. Um, the record its surface itself has grit in it to basically wear that needle down so it doesn't wear right into the record. And so um, the damage so to speak, of those records varies from uh, from record to record. It varies from uh, machine to machine. You can get a record that sounds very, very good um, on one channel of the stereo pair, and the other channel is all noisy. Uh, I have several records in my collection that came, uh, they came with a machine that I bought, um, and with a few exceptions, all of them are noisy on the left channel at the very beginning when you drop the record needle down, and then as you get to the middle of the record, the noise is kind of even, and it's a little bit quieter. And then as you get to the center of the record, the noise starts to increase on the right channel. So mm -hmm. in reality, you should be using a modern cartridge, not a GE VR2, not, not an old cartridge with a steel pin in it. Use a modern Audio-Technica or Stanton uh, or, or Shure and wire it up in stereo um, and listen in stereo. The ultimate recording when you finish, you want to, you want it in mono because there aren't two channels there, but the damage on the grooves, uh, you could get records where one groove on, on one side is noisy and the other side isn't. And because you're now using just one side of the record, you're also opening up that vertical, uh, that vertical plane because this, a stereo cartridge basically will respond to a vertical vibration and can be used to pick up uh, vertical records too. So, um, you want to be able to uh, separate the two channels, but you want a turntable that doesn't have a lot of vibration, which kind of rules out the old Ruscos, sorry to say. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I've seen some of these like really expensive um, uh, turntables that use use laser light to play what's on the grooves. Is that sort of technology applicable to old recordings? It most certainly is. In fact, uh, I forgot the acronym for it, but um, the Library of Congress spent a lot of money developing a laser re retrieval system for records. The problem, there are some problems with it. Uh, the records have to be black. It won't play a record that's not black. Uh, it won't play vertical cut records. Um, so, and it's uh, the, the technology and the, uh, the equipment is quite expensive. So it's not something that's going to be available off the shelf, uh, you know, in the next five years anyway. So what about the RIAA curve? Uh, they used to not have that. In fact, there, there used to be a, well, the, the beauty of standards, there were so many mm -hmm. of them. And well, you'll that's, pick one. That's very true. In fact, versus what we have fact, now, the RIAA. 
-hmm. Right. And that's, that's major. That was really the big beginning of high fidelity when they realized that they could pre-emphasize audio before it got recorded. And then on the other end, de-emphasize all of a sudden the quality of the sound you could reproduce just became incredibly better. Um, a lot of people don't think that there is any kind of EQ for the old 78s, but in reality, the Western electric engineers, when they were uh, assembling the electric recording pro machinery for both Columbia and, our, and Victor back in 1925, uh, did in fact know that they had to change things just a little bit. And their, their methodology was to take test records made in the studio and play them on the machine that Victor or Columbia gave them. Now, the interesting thing is that Victor's records don't, from the 20s do not sound like Columbia's records. Uh, they're all just a little bit different. So, but um, the, the amount of EQ that they used is minimal compared to what we wound up having in the LP era. The RIAA curve, which has been the standard since 1955, basically has a center frequency of 1000 Hertz. And when the record is cut, the high frequencies are emphasized six decibels per octave. That means at 1000 Hertz, there's no emphasis. At 2000 Hertz, which is an octave above 1000 Hertz, it's six decibels. At 4,000, it's 12. At 8,000, it's 16. And wow. anybody who's ever messed around with a, you know, an equalizer, you know, for a rock band or something, 16 dB is quite a lot. And you're only yeah. at 8,000. <laughs> it keeps going all the way up to 16,000. Consequently, on the other end, it cuts at 6 dB. And this is when it's cutting into the record so that the bass notes don't take up as much space as they get written on the record. So the bass is cut six decibels per octave in the other direction, which means when you play it back, your phonograph at home, your, your preamp, has to boost the bass this incredible amount, stop at 1,000 hertz, and then cut the treble all the way down to 16 kilohertz. That means if you're playing a record that was never equalized, well, you're cutting off a lot of the high end. Um, and some people may argue there's, there's, there's no 8 kilohertz on a 78. Well, not necessarily. There there, there is. Um, in the 1920s, it, both uh, Columbia and Victor made test records, and uh, some of the test records have survived. I've seen them available on auction, and they, they recorded frequencies all the way up to 10 kilohertz for testing purposes. They were aware of the practical nature of what people had in the 20s, so it wasn't their mission to record 10 kilohertz, but they understood the nature of it and the physics of it. And um, my own feeling is when you do an archival transfer and you're saving one of these recordings for posterity, make the first recording without any kind of equalization at all and save that as a WAV file. That stays and you don't touch it because in five years or 10 years, uh, just like it has over the last 20, the technology to improve that sound and make it better uh, will get better. And it, there could be technology that will realize, yes, there is all the way up to 12 kilohertz on this 1926 recording. And now we can bring it out. And that recording will blow the doors off of anything that you can do right now. So uh, when making a transfer, if you're, you know, if it's something really, really rare and one of a kind, make a safety that's un, un, unmolested, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> so, so to, how would I, would I, Preamplify that with something flat, like a, like a mic preamp. You could. I I actually my my preamp of choice uh, is an old Marantz Seven T, which has mm. a bypass position. It's got an old seventy eight oh, position that has okay. no equalization on it. But yes, you could use a mic pre. Uh, I my my feeling is um, a lot of people who have not really experienced or really understand how a seventy eight should sound might want to just err on the side of caution and. Put the you know do it with the RIAA first, and then re then go from the assumption that well okay I've I've cut I've transferred it and I've eliminated a lot of the high frequency noise because it did that, so let me play it now and let's reduce the bass a little bit and let's get it to the point where it sounds sounds okay, I mean I would recommend doing that as a first step until you understand a little bit more about what's on the records how to get the really challenging stuff off of them and um, being more familiar with what it should sound like. Um, you know, this, there's a great many of CD reissues out there and a, a couple of the companies that make some of the best uh, recordings that I think of. I mean, there's Bear Family Records, there's Mosaic Records, um, who goes back to the uh, vaults. Mosaic specializes in jazz. But um, there's also uh, Archeophone Records, 
uh, who routinely does cylinders and all kinds of things like that. And there's Rivermont Records. And those people uh, have some very sophisticated equipment, some very uh, well-schooled engineers who work for them, uh, one of whom the one that works for Mosaic Records is a fellow that's been doing 78 transfers since the 1970s. So if you, this, is a set, this is a learning process. I would say if you just want to get the record, the sound off the record and get it to sound pretty good, just start with a decent quality preamp and then go from there. And uh, as, as demand comes or as your, your, you know, your experience level gets better, then take the, take the steps of eliminating all the RIAA and then saying, okay, this is what it really sounds like. Now, what do I need to do? Cause uh, you know, to, 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 to document all of that would take all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've, so John, I've got I have a question for you. Uh, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your thought there, Kirk. <laughs> I cut you off. Well, I, there's, there's different reasons why we transfer, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. You're you're watching or listening to the SBB Web Extra, the thing we do it every month, uh, the SB, uh, SBB Web meeting uh, on the web. And uh, John Landry is our guest talking about archival recordings and getting the best quality off of them. And Chris Schur has a question. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, of course, John, you mentioned um, transferring it to a linear format, which, of course, makes sense because linear is is pure. And we could get into a whole long debate about bit depth and sample rate. So to avoid that confrontation, what's your preferred bit depth and sample rate? Do you think 44.1 and 16 bits is sufficient or do you like to go a little higher? I just generally do the 44.1 only because it's it's common. It's easy. It works. But yes, um, you could with with better technology. Yeah, you could you could do it and, and save it at that. Um, one of the things that I have run into is a lot of people just drop the needle on something without realizing what it is. Uh, and then they they immediately whatever software they're using, whether it's Audacity or uh, Adobe Audition, they just say, clean it up and you get what you get is this unrecognizable, undecipherable <laughs> stuff. So um, it's it's a question of getting you know getting a good transfer right from the beginning and then knowing what to do with it. You know. Good. Let Let's that's, talk that's about just the only one I had. <laughs> uh, uh, Chris, uh, holler back if you, if you have any, if you have something else. Uh, so if you're if you're transferring something because you just want to hear it versus, hey, I know this is something that I want to keep. What are your parameters for that, John? Well, just to hear things. I mean, I've, I've, I've got a couple of turntables set up in my house. And the, uh, the go-to turntable, which um, actually I can show you a picture of it because we have it in one of our visuals here. Um, that would be visual number seven. Uh, my go-to for the actual transfers is a dual 1229. And that's mm -hmm. what I use. I do have a couple of Garrard turntables, and I have the Rusco Rumble Master. And if I just want to listen to stuff, I'm, I'll just drop the needle on one of those just to get an idea. Um, if we look at visual um, visual number eight, visual number eight is a close-up of the general stylus that I use to ascertain, is this record good quality? Is it mediocre quality? Uh, that right there is a 2.75 conical stylus it's truncated, so the very bottom of the uh, point isn't there. It's flattened off. And that is about the right size. It's a little bit larger than, uh, than the generic stylus that you would get from Shure or anybody else. Um, but it's a good enough indicator for me to say, okay, as I listen to it, hmm, this is not a terribly worn record or, oh, God, this thing's been beat to, beat to the socks. <laughs> so um, that's, that's kind of what I do. And um, if I need to do more work, uh, I do have some records that uh, I've run across that are just, uh, they require a lot of work. And so um, with those, it's, you know, it, it, is, it is a long process. Um, one of the things you have to realize is that it's not, you don't just drop the needle and walk away and it's done. It really is. It can be an all day project. I have some records which are cracked um, and they're um, well, one of them in, in particular, which I got from my grandparents is a, a, a fairly, a fairly good jazz record by a group called Clarence Williams blue five from about 1926. The record's got a crack in it going from the edge all the way to the center, um, affecting the play, but everything else about it is fine. So I've actually painstakingly removed the tick that results from that 
cra uh, that crack every revolution. Um, it took me about a day and a half to do that. Um, you could use the software to do that, but I've discovered that if you use the software, um, it doesn't always get rid of the tick. And sometimes it introduces an artifact, either a warble or a bump or something else. Whereas um, if you're very careful and you can zoom the waveform out just to get to the click, which the click actually looks like the Himalayan mountains, and just remove it, all of a sudden the record is incredibly better sounding. The other thing is as you're making the digital recordings, some of those ticks and pops are uh, easily 20 to 30 dB louder than the actual audio you want. So mm. it affects any AGC or anything else that you have. So um, my, you know, my major, my major focus when I, when I shoot for actually restoring a record and making it sound as good as possible is to get rid of as many as the, of the ticks and pops and clicks as I can. And I, I do it by ear and I do it one at a time. Uh, I don't, I don't let the software do it. <laughs> Got you. Yeah. Got you. Um, Hey, uh, one thing that when I was a disc jockey through the 19 late 1970s and into the 1980s, we kept hearing about um, the quality of the vinyl was not as good. And I don't know if that was true or not. Uh, we certainly got record reservice from the record company. So we would cue burn uh, some albums, we would cue burn the 45s. And at, at, at some stations I worked at, we had, we had carts, right? So we would oh, yeah. put our high rotation songs on cart. And then as recurrence and oldies, they would, they would uh, be on typically 45, maybe, maybe 33. So I experienced a fair amount of cue burn. And earlier in our pre-show conference, uh, John, John Landry, you said you didn't experience much in terms of, of cue burn. I wonder why our experiences were, were different. Well, you're absolutely right about the chemical or the, uh, the composition of the records. Uh, starting in the late 1960s, uh, record companies always took back unsold, uh, unsold inventory from record stores. And somewhere around 1970, they started grinding up the, the unsold inventory, especially for 45s, and melting it back down to make newer 45s. Uh, and they also did that with uh, some 45s were made out of polystyrene instead of vinyl, which mm. uh, is a much different material. Uh, sounds different, it handles different, and yes, it, it cue burns differently. Um, um, one of the ways, you, I didn't zero in on it, but there are, uh, there are a handful of ways that some of the manufacturers in the uh, late 70s and 80s identified whether a record was pure vinyl, virgin vinyl, or uh, recycled. And um, one of the records that I took a picture of, uh, the Ramones record, um, it's a Sire record, Warner Brothers product, and um, the Warner Brothers people used to just draw a little uh, a circle. It looks like a hangman. And if you saw that in the runout grooves of the record, that meant it was it was virgin vinyl. It was pure. Huh. Um, the pure vinyl records um, they could still they could still cue burn. One of the things that people have told me, and I never ever had this happen, although. You know, I don't, I don't slip cue records at all anymore. I don't back cue. Uh, I, my feeling is with digital technology now, you should be able to just play the record, trim the front and the back up, and, and, oh, and just yeah, do it digitally. Exactly. Yeah, there's no reason but, to, you know, to cure. There's a, yeah. sizable, there's a sizable number of people out there that go crazy over this and say, oh, no, you're not. That's not real radio. And the truth is, if you got a very great, good copy of something from the 1960s, you know, Another Pleasant Valley Sunday by the Monkees that sounds like it just left the store. Why would you risk messing it up by back cueing it? Um, right. But along those same lines, somebody pointed out, oh, don't use any elliptical styli. Elliptical styli cue burn records. And I never, ever had that problem, ever. I don't know, I don't know where that came from. Um, it does make a little bit of sense because uh, the elliptical styli has a large front to back, which rides in the groove to improve its trackability. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I can understand because it's going against the current. Yeah, it's it's not really meant to do that. So yeah, I suppose it could go a little askew. And but I, I never ever had that issue at all uh, playing records. I don't know where that comes from, but whatever. That's just me. So just in the news uh, this this uh, past weekend was a fire. Uh, I believe in California, uh, Apollo Records, where they they 
Well, I'm not sure what they make. Why don't you tell us what they make at Apollo and well, it, and uh, Apollo, does, does this fire affect the, the industry? Yeah. Well, it's it's a it's a pretty big impact on in a lot of ways. Apollo is what's left over from Audio Disc. Uh, back in the 1940s and 50s, you had two companies that uh, made most of the uh, acetate uh, masters. Apollo became uh, the number one one, and it's pretty much the only domestic one left that makes them. They make these big um, up to 20 inch diameter aluminum coated discs. And every one of those is the very first step in making a vinyl LP. So the material that they make it from is cellulose nitrate. And if you are familiar with uh, old movies, if you're an old movie fan, cellulose nitrate is what old movies used to be made out of. And it's highly flammable. Mm. Oh. So more than likely that, that, you know, careless handling or whatever, that's, that was the cause of the fire. Um, my, I am told, or at least I've been heard, I've been told that they had a significant stockpile of back, uh, of back material. So there's no immediate shortage yet, but, uh, going forward and at, once that's, that stockpile is depleted, they're going to have to resume production in order for people to enjoy, uh, you know, vinyl records, new ones. Um, vinyl records today, uh, I, I find it very interesting. Uh, there's a lot of people that swear by them, and they're people that are younger than all of us. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I've, 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 you know, I, I play in a couple of bands, and I've roadied for a couple of bands, and and I've actually had people come up and say, I don't, I don't, I don't play CDs. Uh, do you have any vinyl? <laughs> and we've, uh, one one fellow that I have, who's a leader of a band in New York City, actually does have a stockpile in his garage, and he says, "Well, uh, I do." <laughs> so wow. uh, you know, hey, we've we've got yeah. we've got this picture of this just so people know what we're talking about this this uh, blank. Uh, and you can you can right right there. This is a picture mm -hmm. that I took a couple of years ago at a studio here in Nashville called Welcome to 1979, where they will <laughs> record <laughs> they'll record either to tape and then master it to disc, or you can record live to disc if you want to. They have a Neumann disc lathe. And oh my goodness, is it that thing calibrated and, and kept clean and beautiful? But they they this is the 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 the, the blank that goes on the Neumann disc lathe, and from that they go through the rest of the of the stamping process. Um, so is 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 this what uh, at Apollo yes. is this what they made? Okay, that, that is indeed, and I'm I'm told uh, I'm I'm told that there is a company in Japan that also is also produces these so we're we're not going to have a complete shortage of records i should point out one thing that uh, a lot of people probably aren't aware of uh, there are a couple of underground people out there that have experimented and um in particular one one is a, a jazz musician uh, his name is colin hancock and uh, colin has uh, actually recorded acoustically using a converted uh, a converted uh, presto lathe and a reconstructed horn and stylus cutter and everything and has been making and issuing uh, brand new 78s for the last couple of years <laughs> so the, uh, the the retro technology is uh, and the interest in it i find fascinating there's some people out there doing things that i thought no one would ever want to do uh, with with old stuff so um the interest uh, the interest and the uh, the the, the the continued, um, you know, longevity of this f format is is definitely there amongst the young folks. Wow, Chris, yeah. uh, uh, do you have any any follow up questions or uh, for for John? And then we'll let John get a get a last word in about this. Uh, I don't. I've since learned a heck of a lot more about disc recording than I thought I had ever learned, and hence forgotten, and have now relearned again. <laughs> so I'm I'm thankful that uh, I've gotten to. Listen to my friend John. By the way, John and I have have common roots. We both worked in Cleveland for a period at competing stations, ah. but we know what com competition is between the engineering community. Uh, <laughs> but I'm I'm happy we got uh, Kirk to, uh, Kirk. We got John to come join us this afternoon uh, on today's SB Web Extra. John, are there some oh. topics or little nuances that you haven't gotten to uh, to mention yet about this? I think we've hit almost. We didn't hit about the the Brunswick Brevi. Uh, yeah, Brevi. Oh, wait, what, what? Well, brevities. Okay. Brevities. What's that? <laughs> well, that's that's an example of one of the early efforts at syndicating radio programs. You had asked uh, me when we had our our uh, our pre um, our pre interview um, about old radio stations from the twenties having a phonograph in the back, and uh, some of them did and used the phonograph as emergency fill music. 
but mm-hmm. it became very apparent amongst the radio listening people and the advertisers in the, in the late 1920s that ticks, pops, and scratches and hiss were something that people didn't want to hear. And so there was an increased emphasis on live uh, performance all the time. Now, live performances aren't always per, you know, practical, especially if you have a small radio station in a small town like this one here, you know, back in the day in Springfield, Vermont. So you needed some relief for your local talent. And so the Brunswick, um, the Brunswick Company, which is the same company today that makes pool tables, back then they were called the Brunswick Bulk Colander Company, and they made phonographs and radios. And they actually uh, introduced a radio program that uh, they sent out. They mailed out shellac discs to radio stations with the intent that they are only supposed to be aired once and then destroyed. And mm. um, so Brunswick Brevities is what it was called. And they were they were part of a series. Um, at least the ones that have survived seem to be part of a series, but they're, they're open-ended. So you could play just one of them and the listener at home won't really miss anything. Or you could play four or five of them in, in, in a half hour and have a, uh, you know, have a little... Uh, specialty program, all of your own. Um, radio stations did get into radio, uh, into, into playing records at one point, so much that uh, in the mid 1930s, RCA Victor and Columbia and Brunswick put on the record label, not licensed for radio broadcast. <laughs> oh, <laughs> to try oh. to, so, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is interesting because there was plenty of people playing them on the radio. It's uh, they, they, how would they ever know, right? Um, so uh, there were many of those. Um, I have a couple of examples of radio programs that were um, syndicated, one of which uh, Coca-Cola had a program called The Coca-Cola Pause That Refreshes, which was on the radio and then on television for years. And it was sy- syndicated by, by mailing records to radio stations, some of which have survived, some of which, you know, were tossed immediately. Um, you know, the, the, the phonograph and, and the radio really do complement each other to the point that uh, I think um, the radio business in the late 1930s with the swing era just res- resurrected the record business. Um, you have to realize in the 1920s, a phonograph record, one Victor record cost 75 cents. Well, 75 cents was a week's worth of groceries for a typical family. So, you know, you, people had maybe 20 or 30 records and that's it. And usually maybe one or two favorites and that's it. Um, by the 1930s, the prices had gone down to 30 cents a piece. People's, you know, yeah. people were willing to spend a little bit more, and the enthusiasm for the latest and greatest stuff, hearing it over and over again, suddenly, want, you know, appealed to people. Um, even people that, uh, you know, had trouble scraping together 30 cents in, in 1935 or 36. But um, the, the entire business did resurrect itself. Um, one, one point that I will point out. Um, there's a book out there called uh, Pop, Pop Memories by Joel Whitburn, which allegedly alludes to record charts and chart-leading records from 1928 and 29. Well, if you read the introduction of the book, he points out that there were no charts. The record companies counted uh, how many reorders they got from record stores as record mm. sales. What drove the music business until 1940 was sheet music sales. So... Um, you know, chart chart topping records and gold records are, are a really a, a rock and roll era thing, and not so much from those older days. And the interesting thing is, in Joel Whitburn's book, he mentions a bunch of records by various artists as being chart toppers, and the records in particular are ones that I've never ever run across. <laughs> you know, as you go to collecting, you know, collecting, and you go to fairs and you go to stores, you notice you know, three or four copies of the same record after a while. And you you can sort of put two and two together and say, yep, this must have been a really popular record. And the ones that I run into a lot are the ones that Whitburn ignores. (laughs) So, you know, it's hard, it's hard to add, you know, it's hard to enforce the cultural uh, references from a later era on an earlier era. (laughs) John, I want to thank you for uh, for having uh, a good insight in, into the past here. Here, I thought that, you know, I well, I, I knew that records ex- preexisted my radio career by a long time. But in the late 70s and early 80s, we were swimming in vinyl in our radio stations. We had uh, the Ralph Emery show, for example, was delivered oh, to country wow. stations. Uh, the, uh, American Top 40, of course, was distributed everywhere. And, and some of us squirreled away copies of that. Uh, and I Dr. even remember... <laughs> Dr. Demento, yes. Even remember the Lutheran Hour, which was 25 minutes long. I never understood that. But all of these were, and so many more, were delivered on on vinyl. Chris uh, Shearer, you certainly had some similar experience at the stations you worked at. Yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. I was thinking of uh, my college radio days. I can't remember the source now, but there were a couple of providers that would send us uh, albums, uh, 33 uh, albums for a whole special interview, concert, whatever it was. Um, and I, thinking about just this program, I was thinking back how I wish I would have saved some of those. But of course, I had to sign an affidavit and return them to get the next one and all that kind of oh gobbledygook but i'm like ah, i wish i could have kept a few of those so oh my goodness wow hey price, we're out of time yeah, yeah john go ahead finish up <laughs> the price of being honest <laughs> yeah yeah yes exactly exactly well we and we didn't have direct digital copying back then so we couldn't make uh make perfect copies uh we <laughs> Hey, we, we have so much more we talk about, but we've got to go. It's been it's been an hour. It's been a delightful hour. John Landry at WCFR Studios, and uh, you've been all up and down the East Coast and in, apparently in Cleveland, Ohio. So, uh, John, thank yep. you so much for your expertise. In the show notes, I'll put as many of the things I can that we talked about, including the thing you just mentioned, Pop Memories by Joel Whitburn and, and the KAB preamp. We had a uh, comment about that. Uh, and anyway, I'll put all the notes we possibly can in there. Thanks so much, John Landry, for being with us. All righty. Thank you for having me. Chris, I, I can't believe we got credit uh, for attending this hour. How can you have so much fun and get credit at the same time? I know, and we're still wearing pants. What do you know? <laughs> well, thanks for watching today's SBE Web Extra. This episode will be available on demand on the SBE YouTube channel. And as Kirk noted, by watching this webcast, you just earned one half of an SBE recertification point when you recertify. We'd like to thank again our sponsor, Wheatstone, for supporting the SBE Web Extra. Watch for the announcement of our next SBE Web Extra, the chapter of the web, next month. On behalf of Kirk Harnack, I'm Chris Scherer, SBE Member Communications Director. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next month.